cool. I think we are we are live. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm very grateful for for the talk here. I think uh, this time, uh, as this uh, Hyperledger uh, conference is starting, we want to change a little bit like the dynamic. We will not do like a, a 40 minutes talk only, uh, and uh, we just literally do some some discussion with Matt. Let's introduce ourselves uh, briefly. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Matt Nelson. I'm a product manager that helps manage. Besu at Consensus. So I've been working uh, with a bunch of the Hyperledger community now for about six months and working on the merge um, you know, for even longer than that. So very excited to talk about kind of what we view as the next steps post-merge, um, how we want Besu to be able to serve a bunch of different use cases, clients, uh, needs. You can just hit escape on that. And um, you know, basically how we see the client evolving in this landscape. Cool. Uh, I'm Francesco. I'm a part of the forum uh, consensus. I'm working mostly on, uh, on DevRel for, uh, for Protocol, uh, Metamask, and Infura. And I'm grateful that we are today explaining the merge, the next steps, and uh, anything that to do with, uh, with Hyperledger Bezo. Cool. I guess we can start. Uh, it will be very interactive, so feel free also to ask questions. Uh, I know we are many today in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, hopefully we get uh, uh, some people asking questions online. Uh, yeah, we just uh, recap. Hopefully, how many people know what's happening? Uh, actually, in one day and a half, a little bit more. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, everybody know probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, why the merge? Why we are here? What's happening? Uh, and uh, and uh, and yeah, the progress in terms of ecosystem that we also overview. Uh, Base was execution client, and uh, and then what's uh, post merge infrastructure we look like. Let's just uh, start, and uh, feel free also to jump in. These are literally like we said, okay, how we feel in 40 minutes. <laughs> so we literally like, put a lot of like uh, interesting slides just to give an overview. But uh, we need to, uh, uh, yeah, we can just uh, quickly quickly show like how uh, Web3 and digital assets in terms of like reaching out audience. We put some numbers here. I don't know, like Matt, feel free also to add things, but uh, those are quickly uh, quick slides before we are getting to the the, the, the important parts. Uh, I think the the next slide it's it's quite interesting. So how how is the Ethereum ecosystem look like? Uh, how big in terms of like user addresses and uh, and uh, transaction per day? So this is something that is uh, is growing a day to day, and uh, and yeah, and uh, I don't know. I think the latest number around uh, 400 400,000 active devs. And we're also seeing, and you know, the builders market is uh, is, is remaining uh, intact and uh, is is still growing uh, compared uh, compared the, <laughs> the, the 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 token markets that we see today. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, cool. I don't know any questions until so far or anything to add. Let me jump. So why the merge? Uh, I will stop uh, speaking here. But uh, Matt, you wanna you wanna say quickly what's uh, what's the roadmap and why we are here? What's happening in uh, one day and a half. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as the first bullet outlines, there's an increasing urgency around proof of stake. Um, the reason being is that Ethereum has roughly the carbon footprint of the country of Finland, uh, and that is something that we're eager to get rid of uh, for a number of absolute reasons. Um, the, you know, kind of less sustainable points under that are that we think more enterprises will be interested in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology when the, uh, you know, nightmare of, of sustainability is, is resolved within the network. Uh, so we, we're really eager to get rid of that so that more and more folks can come online without having the, uh, you know, the frankly embarrassing carbon footprint that Ethereum has today. Um, there's also a desire to uh, democratize access to the network. Proof of stake uh, in this case will allow more and more nodes to come online um, that are not basically concentrated in the hands of mining pools. Um, and of course, there's optics around the, the usage of these things, as I mentioned. And there's going to be changes to the economics of the Ether token that we are really excited about. Uh, and those around the issuance rate specifically, but there are some other tweaks that I encourage you to read about online uh, to how the economics there work. Uh, the other is that, you know, with the merge kind of sets the stage for the emergence of kind of a set of protocol upgrades in Ethereum, uh, specifically around rollups, other L2s, and other scaling technologies. One of the misconceptions of the merge is that it will decrease gas prices, it will increase. Uh, scale and speed on the network, but that is actually not the case. But it does set the stage for some upgrades that will 
uh, allow those technologies like rollups to become first class citizens on the network, uh, which will hopefully see a lot of these uh, improvements come down the line much, much faster now that we're also removing the biggest obstacle to upgrading the Ethereum roadmap. Um, if you go to the next slide, it talks kind of more specifically around what we're looking at. Um, some of the points that I had mentioned previously, again, the, the reasons why we think that more and more enterprises will come onto mainnet after the merge uh, are around these kind of four points. The energy efficiency is, although listed at number two, is personally my number one. Um, the you know, diversity and openness of the network, as I mentioned, as we remove the need for hardware intensive mining operations to participate, uh, more and more um, validators and clients can come online and participate in the network. And we're going to see, I hope, a lot more enterprises join. Um, yes, you still need a, a capital investment in order to participate in proof of stake. Although for a lot of the enterprises that I think are, are ready to join the public network, uh, that investment is, is not quite so large. Um, the third and fourth point are really about the hard work that's been put into the merge from an architecture perspective around the seamless transition. Uh, so APIs will largely not be changing. Uh, as Dano mentioned, the Randau opcode is one of the only ones that requires a change. Um, so we're really making this easy for developers to continue to use the technologies before and after. Um, yes, Basu has had to undergo a lot of changes in order to uh, kind of go through this merge transition. But as far as developer experience is concerned and those building on top of the client, I think that it's, you know, it's going to be pretty much the same before and after with additional components around proof of stake. Uh, the last is number four, it's better for DeFi. Uh, that is really based around the economic changes that I mentioned, um, changes to the issuance of Ether, changes to the way that if Ether is, uh, you know, burned. So essentially, you know, with in combination with some previous things mentioned, or I encourage you to look up EIP 1559, um, then you know, we're, we're going to see a lot different economics around the way that Ether is, is operating. Yeah, I think uh, definitely also like the, I mean, what you're saying about the openness uh, and diversity of, of Ethereum clients will play a big role because today, as we know, we are kind of on, on a monopoly and uh, having a, a differentiator in, in clients is, is playing a big role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're seeing, you know, Besu has grown tremendously in the past few months. We're really excited about that. Um, but it's frankly due to a lot of the work that people in the community have done to help develop a client for Ethereum mainnet uh, and making sure that we are doing uh, press around what that looks like for diversity, participation, and for getting enterprises involved. You know, the next slide. Uh, key takeaways, we can, I think, skip this. Yeah, I'd rather go straight to questions. Exactly. That's, that's, uh, that's a long, uh, I mean, that's not long, but uh, it is quite interesting exactly what we talk right now uh, uh, around, uh, around <coughs> key takeaways. Cool, yeah, merge timeline. I think we already kind of like passed, uh, passed this, uh, but, but it's quite interesting to have an overview. Uh, I think Bellantrix was successful with some bugs. Yep. Right. September 6th uh, was the beginning of the merge countdown. Um, the actual date and time is predicated on network conditions, uh, but there is a prediction that it will be sometime around Thursday morning on UTC. So if you're in the United States like me, that'll be probably Wednesday evening. Uh, and if you're in Europe, it's probably sometime Thursday, very early morning. Um, we might see the hash rate and the network drop and delay that timeline a little bit uh, as miners exit the network. Um, but we're hoping that it will stay relatively stable and the merge will be completed sometime on Thursday. Yeah. That's... All those things to say that timeline is quite long because there's a long and storied history of the development of the Beacon Chain. Um, and it's been very exciting to participate in that. But you know, really, it comes down to what we're looking at here on the screen. Um, we have a proof of work based Ethereum today. Uh, and we have additionally uh, currently running proof of stake beacon chain, which is the consensus layer, as it's called. Um, and as we go through the merge, the current kind of proof of work stack will be called the execution layer. And that gets us to kind of the crux of what we're looking at here with, with Basu's evolution from an Ethereum 1 client to kind of an execution client. Uh, and the reason around that split is that the consensus layer has been intentionally removed from the kind of execution uh, because it, one, allows us to run consensus in a way that is based off of proof of stake. But two, it, it, it splits out kind of the complexity of, of executing and operating on those smart contract layer from the consensus mechanisms. So this doesn't immediately provide the speed and scale that we might think with the merge, but it will set the stage, like I mentioned, for a lot of changes to the way that those two layers work separately to allow us to make some very interesting protocol upgrades. Um, you might have heard of, of sharding. That's one of them. Um, 
I encourage you to look up EIP 4844 if you're interested to learn more. Um, but basically, uh, as you can see still, well, my head's kind of blocking it, but it's on this bottom layer. Um, so the, the, the data availability that charting is going to pro provide will be on the consensus layer. So splitting these out into two pieces has provided us uh, the ability to really innovate. And it allows Beisu, which sits in this blue uh, box, the execution layer, to become a lot more lean and a lot more focused on serving different types of use cases. And at the end of the day, we get a scalable, sustainable Ethereum, but we also get a lot of other kind of benefits of this, um, as Beisu is not just compatible with Ethereum mainnet, uh, because it's an execution client that we're interested in right here. It's executing EVM-based smart contracts. It's executing, um, you know, in theory, transactions that don't really require kind of all the, the baggage of the EVM. Um, and it's, we'll, we'll get more to this in, in the future slides as we go along, but it's, again, splitting this out has allowed kind of Beisu to reevaluate what we're looking at as a client. And we really want the community to help us kind of shape what that looks like going forward. And how can we add you know, more consensus mechanisms? How can we you know, plug this layer out and put something else in on the bottom? You know, so that means support for different kinds of networks. Um, Dan just gave a talk on how they use the base EVM and Hedera. Um, you know, in theory, you could use the Hedera consensus service to run a network where Beisu just does the execution, and that doesn't even require using all the overhead of the other Hedera pieces. So there's very interesting things um, that are going on. Uh, and I think that if we continue a little bit, I can kind of, kind of break that yeah. down some more. But we can also pause for some questions. I know that was a lot. I'm excited about the, the layer of infrastructure we're posing for, for layer twos. That's definitely one thing. How many of you guys know uh, the Beacon chain exists? Just raise your hands. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Cool. Yes, please. So, what's your view on the security of the network after moving to proof of it? Because there is a lot of questions that, you know, as clever as proof of stake might be, it doesn't have the security of proof of work. Mm -hmm. So, the question, yeah. Back some, some incidents later, so earlier this year, that kind of showed some of the things that you can do cleverly to kind of attack proof of stake network. So, how would that impact? So, so the question is how, how it will impact the security overall. Yeah, for proof of stake versus proof of work. So um, that's a great question. And the, you know, there, there's a bunch of different answers. Uh, and they all kind of approach this from multiple angles. With the beacon chain itself, uh, the, the, the reason that proof of stake is effective is because there are monetary requirements to attack the network. So that, you know, you might have heard of a 51% attack. Um, that's the same in proof of work as it is in proof of stake. If you control 51% of the consensus power, let's call it, of the network, you can make changes to the way that the ledger operates, and then you can validate those changes with your percentage of the network to make sure that it appears valid. So in proof of work, that was prohibitively expensive for a number of reasons due to, to mining power, essentially, requiring hardware. Uh, in proof of stake, it's prohibitively expensive due to the fact that you would have to own over 50% of the market cap of Ethereum. And if there was a centralized entity that would be approaching that threshold, it would be extremely visible within the public ledger of the network to say, you know, XYZ organizations own 51% and therefore would control a number of validators to do certain things. Um, there are a lot of other kind of nuances to how that specifically works. Um, and a lot of it comes down to there's also kind of self-policing within the network after the move to proof of stake. So validators can slash or nominate to slash other validators when they misbehave. So say I try to fake that I have 51% of stake. I use my keys in my validators to, to pretend like I have two stakes when I only have one. If somebody notices that fact, they can effectively reduce my stake to zero and are rewarded for that fact. So I think that we're going to see you know kind of these Watchdogs come within the network. We've already we had our, a couple of slashing events recently. People are, I hope, incorrectly putting their validator keys in multiple locations. Um, but but we're we're starting to see kind of an uptick of people who are pe penalizing others in the network. One to reward themselves, but two to really keep the network secure as a whole. Um, and not to turn this into a conversation. But so so your assumption is most of people are going to continue to keep the stake, right? Because yep. for whatever reason. Yes, uh, that is true. Um, we would hope that everyone would not. So the question to reiterate for the stream and for everyone that wants to hear is that the you know as folks exit the network, the number of validators would go down, and therefore the amount of 
value needed to attack the network will decrease. Um, yes, there, so, so there is an example for where you could say, oh, I would exit a ton of validators over here and then start uh, like a bunch really quick so that I have quickly have a percentage of the stake and I can take it over. However, there's queues to both enter and exit the network. So in theory, that attack wouldn't be impossible kind of like as like a flash loan-esque exploit. Um, and two, the hope is that as we add withdrawals and exits from the network, the demand for staking will not go down, it will go up. Because the more liquid stake becomes, the hopefully the more validators will come online. Um, there's also the notion of liquid staking in general where I don't necessarily need 32 ETH to run these validators. So you're using a technological approach to add more validators to the network. So there's things like Rocket Pool, like Lido, where they match up basically smaller stakes with larger stakes to create one unique validator. Yes, you have to presume that those organizations won't collude against the network as a whole. Um, I think that we are going to see kind of centralization around certain entities that control portion, large portions of network stake, like big exchanges or these um, groups like, like Lido, et cetera, that control a lot of these stakes. Uh, but it, it is hard to say how this will play out in reality. Um, I'd encourage you to read up. Um, Um, maybe my understanding of how the secure of the network would be is an open question. Um, but the, the, again, the, the costs have moved from basically the, the hardware perspective to an actual stake in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And if you look at the breakdown of the top sets of validators, so you know these accounts, since the validator keys are basically, there's public keys for all these things, you can in theory look and see who controls what portion of stake. We're not quite at the point where we have to get worried about centralized entities controlling like, like you know, XYZ exchange has maybe 20% of all online validators. Um, we're not quite at the point where we're worried about that yet. Um, but there are some open questions, though I think as far as the merge transition is concerned, um, a lot of the kind of mitigations come down to like the technological components as opposed to the economic components. So. We're feeling very confident in the way that the merge is going to progress because of the kind of, one, the robustness of the actual consensus algorithms. So um, the proof of stake is based on something called um, LMD Ghost, which is just a fork choice algorithm. Um, so there's a lot of like nuance in that. Um, there's kind of nuanced mitigations to certain edge cases. Uh, researchers have been spending years trying to figure out what they could be for this exact scenario. Um, once the things level off after the merge, I think, like you said, we'll, we'll be able to really evaluate what the validators, I think my computer, no, no, it's all good. I think that the validators will have to see how the chips kind of fall. But I, again, we're not really approaching the point where any specific entities have, even nation states like would have the ability to create these kinds of. So that's what I want to say, as more mission critical applications, like micro enterprise applications, then a state actor is not having Yes, but in, so think about it this way. As more mission critical act, uh, applications and things migrate to the network, more and more folks will be participating directly or indirectly. And you'd hope that more value comes onto the network distributed via decentralization, whether geographically, whether you know, politically, um, to the point where the cost to attack the network increases as there's more participation by users. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, but again, there's a lot of, none of these things happen instantaneously. There are a lot of signals to this kind of thing. Um, it is a public distributed ledger, so you would presume that nation states would be watching what each other are doing if they're accumulating hundreds of billions of dollars worth of ETH in specific you know, locales. I think that that would be 
something that people would want to look at for sure. Um, I think we should, in the interest of time, continue yeah. forward. Um, but yeah, I love these questions. Just wanted to show the 51% the uh, attack would be around 25 billion in the least. Um, yeah, Beacon Chain status, this I think was like a couple of weeks ago, but around uh, um, 400,000 uh, active validators. I don't know what's, what's today, the, the amount, but. It's, it's uh, I don't know, more and more are coming online, frankly, by the second, uh, as people get ready for the merge. Um, so the, the activation queue is getting quite long, which is good. Uh, and like I said, these queues are designed in such a way where it's you can't just jump on the network all at once and can start immediately controlling a portion of the stake. Um, and there are also exit queues to prevent kind of the opposite, where you can't just withdraw all of your stake so that maybe somebody else has a 51% stake. Um, yeah, I think we should get straight to the bulk about Besu. Um, as uh, mentioned before, Besu is a monolithic Ethereum client. Um, what that means is that it essentially tries to do everything. As Dana was mentioning, uh, it serves a variety of different use cases, not just within proof of work or proof of stake, um, but it also serves BFT-based consensus algorithms. Um, and to this point, it's been quite you know, great, actually. This is a pretty good view of the architecture right here. Uh, the pieces to note that are kind of unique to public networks are probably the Engine API uh, that is unique to Ethereum-based public network consensus. Um, and again, we have proof of work consensus, click consensus, and BFT consensus down here. Uh, the big, the reason that the EVM is in a dark green box right here is because, as Dano mentioned in his previous talk, it is actually separated out from the rest of the components of the architecture. It can be removed and put in other networks and used as a standalone module. Uh, and it has been intentionally designed that way uh, through Dano's very hard work to make that happen. Uh, and the reason that we want to do things like that is because whether we like it or not, the EVM is coming to gobble up a lot of the smart contracting world um, for applications that are created today. Uh, a lot of the other talks and a lot of the other Hyperledger-based projects, uh, their goal is to bring EVM compatibility to other things or to create interoperability directly with the EVM. Um, and you know. Again, I'm not here to comment on whether that's a good thing or not, but it is what it is. And within Besu, it is a first class citizen. And what we're trying to do is make a lot of these other boxes dark green as well, where the components are not necessarily stuck in this layout, and you don't necessarily need all of these components. So the reason that these kind of things are dotted lines is because they are optional. Those are privacy related features. You don't necessarily need to use them. You don't necessarily need to you know, not use them. And they kind of touch a lot of different areas, which is why things can get kind of messy. Um, we like this picture for what it is, but we're really trying to move kind of towards a new paradigm. And I think that that's being driven in part by the fact that we support a lot of different network types and that we want to continue to support different network types and that we want to support more network types. Um, and they might not use POW, they might not use proof of stake, they might not use BFT consensus. You know, we, we want to, to kind of lean into the pluggable consensus. We want to lean into the fact that the EVM can go away and, you know, or sorry, not go away rather, but exist in other components, exist elsewhere, because our users want different things. So if we go to the next slide here, Francesco, um, like, what does this kind of boil down to? What do the users and developers want? They want an execution client for Ethereum proof of stake. Sure, they want to be able to run on mainnet. They want a client to connect to a consortium network. Maybe they want to join you know, one of the pre-existing Ethereum-based uh, private networks, and they want to be a node that validates transactions running proof of authority or BFT consensus. They might be an infrastructure uh, you know, software provider, and they want to build a business with a blockchain. They don't necessarily know what that means, and they don't necessarily know what all of their requirements are right now, because frankly, the requirements reveal themselves much mm -hmm. further into the line of developing blockchain-based applications than you would think up front. Uh, and they might want a diverse software to connect to many different kinds of networks. Uh, this could be like you know, Gnosis Chain, for example, some other L1s. They, we can provide Besu as a piece of software that connects to those different things. It could be a chain link node. It could be you know, a bunch of different applications run semi-adjacent platforms to mainnet Ethereum, or they run entirely different chains with different chain IDs, and we want to be able to serve kind of all these different things. Or they may just want EVM execution. So the users really don't necessarily know what they want up front, which is why a monolith appears enticing, because you get everything in one box. However, 
we only serve kind of the one base view thing, and if they just want one of these boxes, they have to get the rest of the cruft kind of with it. So what needs to change, right? Kind of two things that I view, and again, these are this is a proposal for what we want to do with bases. So this is an active discussion. We want to actively bring people in. You know, we have a binary distribution, but we want to go to binary distributions, multiple. We want to move to a proof of stake distro. We want to have a distro for private networks, for proof of work networks, what, what have you. Um, we don't want to provide everything that the users don't want to need. And we think this is kind of a step one that's a quick win where you can decouple some of these components in a way that makes Basu leaner uh, and quicker. And it's, for example, I just want X, Y, Z for my infrastructure. And that means we can give them modularization and componentization um, where I, for example, need to run just the EVM for my infrastructure because I want to make an application for my new layer one that I don't necessarily, it hasn't been built yet. It's a new blockchain technology that hasn't been built yet. I just want an EVM. Or I just want to run a chain link node, like I said, and, and I don't need all of the stuff to do with proof of stake consensus. I just need RPC. I need ba RPC from Besu to be able to run queries. I just want to get data from the network. I don't want to participate at all. Then you can have state storage within Besu and you just pull the stuff out via the RPC. So it's a, if we go to the next slide actually, it's basically like how do we make Besu just this execution client, right? I'd like to skip actually two slides ahead in the interest of time. This one, sorry, this is perfect. Pluggable execution, pluggable consensus, possibly pluggable storage. We have to figure that one out, but it's something that we're looking at very closely because um, there's a lot of nice use cases that are enabled by pluggable storage. And then networking, pluggable networking. You know, what, like, that, that one is unique. I haven't, we haven't thought too much through that yet, but you know, there, as Dano mentioned, we have different kinds of networking and we have different kinds of interfaces that are not just JSON RPC. How do we create a modular code base where I'm a new developer, I have this base client in front of me, but I know that I have a hard requirement for gRPC. I slot this thing out because you know, I have a very clean interface between JSON RPC and my execution, and then I'm able to replace that, right? Uh, I have a very clean, uh, you know, line between, for example, the EVM and this potentially, you know, I use Engine API here, but I, I think that this is frankly could become a lot bigger to mean any external connection to the EVM, um, where I have a roll up and I just want to plug, like, we can already expose the Engine API in a, in a way today, since, since proof of stake has opened up this kind of big um, rethinking of how these clients actually build blocks, execute them, and then move on with their day. Why don't we just open this up so that any, like, any consensus mechanism that happens in theory outside of Basu land can work right away with this Engine API, which is already designed to interact directly with the EVM, directly with state storage, um, you know, not necessarily with networking, but basically it's a, it's a big line in. How do we turn this into a much bigger notion, right? So I think that the client that we're looking to build serves all of these use cases because it's designed to have exposure to what you need and then you can drop in the rest. And it's an open source product, right? If I wanna tweak Besu to serve my certain needs, or if I want to build a plugin that extends the Engine API or extends the JSON RPC, I can, you know, it, it, as we move to a modular architecture, I think that that's what we want to see, right, is opening these connection points up so that folks can come in and design exactly what they need and drop everything else. Um, not because it's, you know, one, because we want to move to a more sustainable code base, but two, because I frankly think that we're moving towards a multi-chain world that will require you know, some or all of these components, and we want to be able to serve that because it's the best way to bring in more developers to Besu. It's the best way to bring more developers into the Ethereum and Ethereum adjacent ecosystem. And, you know, it's the best way to build the best execution client we can. Um, let me take a breath and see what we have here in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> Any questions? I think modularity is, is the next big thing. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, it's like that, like CAC, the Cactus team is now becoming the Cacti team and they're building all these interoperability components. 
But imagine if you got a lot of that for free by just exposing the low-level APIs that you needed to interact with the blockchain state and the blockchain virtual machine. Um, not that I don't like those projects. I just think that we can go bare metal on this one and avoid a lot of that stuff by opening up these kind of four layers. Consensus, interface, execution, and then you know the rest is already essentially build your own, choose your own adventure. Because Baseu has pluggable storage to a degree. We have several options. And you can write your own plugins to do whatever storage you want anyway. Um, we have relatively modular networking. And we have a kind of plugin interface, which I haven't discussed much because I frankly think it needs kind of a revamp or it needs to be opened up a little bit more or even created into the thing that I'm trying to describe here. But you can already extend Baseu to do most of what you want to do through this plugin interface. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, Legos. Dano kept saying, talking about Legos, and it's, this is really just a bunch of components, and you only need some to do what you need to do. Uh, and my goal is to make Besu kind of a prolific piece of infrastructure software, and to do that, I think that we want to accomplish something that looks a lot like this. Cool. Either, either everybody sleeping or yeah. no questions. <laughs> um, and then again, back to the privacy thing. I think that you know, once we solve the problem I made on the previous slide, we get this for free. Pluggable consensus, pluggable networking, and then Tessera as an optional component of the base U code base. Not going away, just moving. <laughs> I think we, we reserve a couple of slides. Oh, there you go. Oh, one more. It's like an animation slide. I need to get rid of this crap. Um, but, so why, again, why, why am I doing all the stuff that I just, or why is the, like, the, why do we want to move Besu towards this kind of new mission statement? And it's right here, right? We want to enable network participation. I don't know what that looks like in two years, and I don't really want to know. I just want the client to be agnostic enough to serve the network, like the users of the infrastructure to participate in whatever network they want to, whether that's, again, Ethereum, something different, something yet to be created. Um, I think that all the building blocks are relatively the same. And also, we want Besu to still be relevant in five, 10 years. And if things shift away from this kind of vision, if we have a modular, lean execution client, we will be able to adapt to the changing landscape regardless. Um, and hopefully, our users will not have to change away from Besu or to throw away what they've already worked hard on because the client will evolve kind of with the landscape. So again, to read what I've written up here, it's space who enables network participation for institutions. It supports Ethereum, post-merge, private networks, mining networks. And we aim to evolve for a multi-chain EVM-compatible world around you know, EVM-compatible virtual machines, roll-ups, hybrid networks, side chains, more, uh, all that good stuff with a familiar license, uh, a familiar programming language, uh, institutional grade features, uh, and hopefully keeping our nodes very low overhead as we move to a kind of lightweight uh, approach to stake Ether to do interactions with any blockchain networks that run on similar tech. Uh, and we want to be the best and most flexible infrastructure for people looking to participate in blockchain networks. Yeah. That was the, that was the pitch. Yeah, that's the pitch. <laughs> Um, this is kind of a boilerplate, why do you want to do, or why do you want to run on public networks? So, I mean, another of the big reasons that, you know, Francesco and I are here today is not to espouse Besu. It's mostly to talk about why do you want to participate as an enterprise in public networks. This doesn't just mean Ethereum. I'm talking everything. Like, we want to see enterprise, we think enterprise will converge on kind of a mainnet focus within the future anyway, so getting your toes wet now is definitely valuable. Um, and we think that Besu is a great means to do that. And it's rewarding. You can get literally paid to do this. Uh, you know, As I mentioned, there's a capital investment in actually staking. But the staking rewards will likely be around 12% post-merge, which is pretty great. Um, that number will go down over time. Uh, however, it's slated to stay around 12% post-merge for a little while. As more validators come online, we'll see that come down. But it is a literally rewarding prospect for enterprises to learn how to run node infrastructure on public networks. And that means getting the right approvals to do so with your organization's infosec teams, um, 
learning how to set up the infrastructure in a way that is highly available and fault tolerant and all that other good stuff, uh, and making sure that you have like everything kind of squared away so that when, again, when these things come to disrupt what your business does, you don't have to be reactive. You can be a little bit proactive um, because I believe that a lot of the public network infrastructure will disrupt many enterprises. Of course, not all. But I also believe that, it, that enterprises can feel safe and secure in participating in public networks for a number of reasons. Um, however, I'm working with Hyperledger to provide a bunch of different workshops on what that actually means. So I know Antoine, one of the BASU contributors, has run a great, recently a great workshop on how to operate and extend Hyperledger BASU. Uh, extend, as I mentioned, there's that plugin interface where you can change the way that the client operates. Uh, and operate is self-explanatory. You have to actually know how to run it. Um, but there are more details. I think the next workshop is October 5th. Uh, so check out on Hyperledger. And they will. the wiki has the dates. And I will be hosting a workshop on enterprises running public network infrastructure. And we may even stake some fake ETH. So that'll be fun. That'll be cool, yeah. <laughs> we also have a bunch of like uh, developer community calls, calls on the protocol side from consensus that are, might be worth to check out. And uh, the contributor call also on the Bezos side mm -hmm. might be also cool. Yeah, cool. I think that the rest is just questions. Or actually, no, that's right. You're Francesco. Oh, Thanks. no, no, that's the boring stuff. But uh, I mean, I don't know how boring is that. But basically, like, super long story short is, I mean, I don't know. Everybody saw the Vitalik paper on, uh, on the Verge, uh, you know, Merge, Verge, Surge, all, all those great namings. But literally, it's what, uh, what Matt uh, is mentioning. Uh, Post-Merge, nothing is, is finished. It's, it's literally like a process. And uh, you know, sharding is, is the next big uh, uh, etap, and uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I really also recommend and feel free also to, to reach out for, for the slides, like a couple of links always on the on the merge uh, research and uh, and specific also resources on uh, on uh, on podcast and uh, it's exactly like explaining all this uh, paper because uh, I think it's uh, it's full of great information on on the next uh, progression and roadmap of uh, of ETH. Uh, yeah, this is like something super interesting that we find out on, on, on Reddit uh, visualization, but uh, it's a mix on, uh, on how, how, on how uh, Ethereum will look like in 2025. I think uh, for digesting this, I, I took maybe like two weeks, <laughs> but for what I'm understanding, it's literally like a, a mix of those four, uh, four uh, uh, top, top and left. I don't know, sidechain layer ones. Uh, it's quite interesting. I don't know, Matt, if you know more, but around those uh, volitions and uh, va validiums and uh, obviously roll-ups we know already but uh, I don't know if you if you know more a little bit on, on those yeah. two. Uh, it, it boils down a lot to data availability and proofs um, so there's some complex cryptography in f f through volitions and validiums in proving how certain data interacts and exists within the network um, I, again it takes more than the three minutes we have left to explain volitions. Um, but I think that the key, pe the key pieces, as Francesca mentioned, is that like we are going to continue to see side chains in L1s. We're going to continue to see Ethereum execution layer, consensus layer, and shards, and then focus on rollups here. Uh, and and you know, what does this all look like? Is basically how do we provide data to users cheaply? How do we continue to scale? How do we serve a multi-chain world? I think that the Ethereum roadmap has actually been smart in evolving to not presume that it's the only L1 that will ever exist that has smart contracts. Um, so I think that making all these things first class citizens is kind of like 2025, like this long-term vision for Ethereum is how do we combine everything together as opposed to trying to segment the network. Uh, and I think that that's you know, done through a bunch of these different bridges that have been proven to be a little error prone up to this point, but working on that um, and using zero knowledge proofs and other proof systems um, to basically tie everything together and use Ethereum as this kind of settlement layer for this new vision, right? Um, is, is taking in all of the different blue boxes, which are doing variety of proofs, a variety of mathematical calculations to ensure that the data either exists, is correct, or hasn't been tampered with. And then it sticks them on that execution layer in the state storage, and then it communicates out to the rest of the network via so this pink box. Um, Cool. Any questions so far? We have, we have like a minute, but <laughs> 50 seconds. But I think, yeah, we'll put some uh, learning uh, resources. That might be cool. I think Tim also speaking virtually today or tomorrow. Or tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow. More on the merge tomorrow with some folks from the Ethereum Foundation speaking. Um, 
Yeah, we also did a bunch of interviews at FConnect on, on the merge and the next, next steps with, uh, I think, Justin Drake and Tim. That, were, that was really helpful. Any questions so far? I know there were a lot of like information. So I think this is something that you know it's, it's need a little bit. We can. I, I can send it to you and uh, okay. yeah, or attach. We can send directly. I think Hyperledger will also send them out, but we, we can send these directly too. Sure. Yes. Beautiful. Any other questions so far? Well, we're ready to to go home. I think we're literally the last talk. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks,